I am over the moon to have Ms. Melinda Mayor Lowry um, be our uh, keynote speaker for this symposium. Um, Melinda is an associate professor and director of the Center for the Study of American of the American South at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, she is one of our people. She has provided the formal text about our experience and who we are. Uh, she authored the book, um, Lumpy Indians in the Jim Crow South, and now she has her new book that is recently published just within a month or so, mm -hmm. um, called um, The Lumpy Indians and American Struggle, which really digs deep into um, our origins that exceed the boundaries of North Carolina, um, even this continent for that fact. And, um, and it's really piecing together a lot of the information that we found and put together just a really beautiful book. I'm halfway through. Um, I started reading uh, this weekend and I think I had to text her about five or six times with excitement. It is a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, and after uh, her talk, we're going to take a break and have a book signing. We'll have books available for purchase if you didn't bring your own. Um, but we are just so honored and blessed to have you here. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Melinda Maynard Lowry. by our people. And I look out here and I see folks who've known me since I was a baby. <laughs> and I see people who, whose um, contributions are instrumental. And at this particular, I'll talk more about that tonight, but at this particular moment, Ms. Susan Lowry is, I mean, her contributions to genealogical research, if you don't already know about them, this is the day to, to find out. And you contributed so much to this research in this book. I'm so grateful. The other person I have to call out is Miss Barbara Brayboy Locklear. There she is in the back. And uh, she's known me really since I was a baby, baby, baby. <laughs> and uh, other than my, my, my own mother, who will also be here tonight, she was my first and best writing teacher. So all the writing that, I, that I'm so blessed to do are, are because of our Lumbee community and, and um, the women that have built uh, my confidence up, the men who have built my confidence up. Dr. Cummings mentioned my father, Waltz Maynard, who was a tremendous individual. Um, and we, as we were joking about our stubbornness, me and my sister Cherry's stubbornness earlier, we come by it honest. <laughs> because um, our father was that that way and then dr. Marianne Jacobs you know especially in the last five or seven years as I was working most intensely on this book I would call I would text Marianne and say can you tell me about this and this have you heard stories of this this Lawrence Locklear is Lawrence still in the room I saw him earlier but anyway Lawrence is the other person uh, in particular uh, here at here at UNCP who has made a tremendous difference to this to this research and so anyway, I'm just so grateful to be able to have an opportunity to talk about it with you. I really hope you'll have some hard questions or some things that you want to like wrestle with because one of the things I've learned doing Lumbee history is that no one knows the whole story. We all have different pieces of the story and then we need to stitch them together. And so what this book is, is just my one version of stitching it together. I really hope that other people will take the knowledge that they have and feel through the resources at this museum, at this campus, at the library, at other places, feel empowered to put those together, to stitch those pieces of knowledge together on your own to tell, to tell your story. Your story of the Lumbee people, your story of your family. Um, so today I want to discuss some fundamental questions that have really complicated answers. And I can't live without nuance. I'm so glad you brought up our Senator Elizabeth Warren because that's a conversation that exists in our nation that doesn't have any nuance. It's so strange. 
But as Indian people here in the United States, we can't live without nuance. And so, but we have very fundamental questions we ask of ourselves that they have very equally complicated answers. And so, 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 the, so the questions are, what makes the Lumbee people an Indian people? Why are our genealogies important to knowing who we are? And then, of course, why does this matter today? So all societies are fundamentally built on families and families that attach themselves to places. For American Indians, families and family networks, what the Lumbees, of course, refer to as our people, form the basis of the communities that Europeans later called tribes. Tribes are composed of members, uh, usually people linked by kinship, marriage, and sometimes adoption. They reside in a homeland, what we have here, that they may have occupied for as many as thousands of years or as few as a hundred years. Either way, the places where Indians live is called Indian country. Attachment to family and places is a key part of being Indian, and so is belonging to a tribe. Knowledge of kinship, or the relationships between different families, and place, which are the stories told about families in certain locations, are critical to Lumbee identity. A person is Lumbee if two criteria are met. One has ancestors that are members of this long-standing community, and one's family still identifies with the community and the specific places within it. So, when one Lumbee meets another, two questions reveal everything you need to know <laughs> about the other's identity. Who's your people? But then, of course, where do you stay at? The next one is important, too. When I tell my people who my grandparents or great-grandparents are, that, of course, tells them something about me. Uh, Foy and Bloss Cummings on my mother's side, and Wayne and Lucy Maynard on my father's side. Where do you stay at, for, my, for me, is a somewhat more complicated question. It situates someone in relation to our homeland. If I say I'm from Durham, where I grew up, that tells the listener that I might not know everything I ought to about what it means to be Lumbee in Robinson County. But if I tell people I was born in Robinson County and raised in Durham, that tells them something else. That my family has a close bond with the community, that my parents made considerable sacrifices to raise me to value my culture, even though I may not have a day-to-day -day experience of living in a Lumbee community. Two important facts have helped me understand Lumbee genealogy, the framework that those two place and, and people fit into. Two, two facts. First, histories of Lumbee families are not exclusive to one historic tribe. We descend from several historic tribes, mm -hmm. including the Tuscarora, which is the tribal name, of course, used by many of our kin. And because it's difficult for me to utter Lumbee and Tuscarora every time I talk about our people, I hope you'll forgive me if I just use the name Lumbee most of the time. <coughs> Um, second, second fact is that ideas about race cannot adequately replace ideas about family. My nephews, for example, who have a non-Lumbee mother, are no less Lumbee than my daughter, who has two Lumbee parents. I have cousins whose mothers or fathers were not Lumbee, and I not, did not even realize they were, quote, half Lumbee until I was a teenager. They lived in Robinson County and were closer to what it meant to be Lumbee than I was growing up in Durham. So parentage is only one factor, and often a small one, in how Lumbee families count their kin. Our ability to practice inclusion predates contact with Europeans, and that continues to be a vital part of our survival. So I hope that what I tell you about Lumbee origins will demonstrate that in some ways, knowing where we come from is far less important than knowing how we survived, knowing why we're still here. But I'm going to begin in the middle of the story. In the winter of 1865, which was the bleakest winter, must have been the bleakest winter of George Lowry's life, he stood on the steps of the Robinson County Courthouse. Most of you know this story well. He had just emerged from an inquest into the murders of his two sons. He was 67 years old, born at the end of the American Revolution. The county coroner had identified the Confederate soldier responsible for his son's deaths at the inquest, but the killer remained at large. The sheriff refused to arrest him. Consumed with the iniquity of these events, Lowry unchained a spontaneous, unrestrained history lesson. 
describing his people's conception not in the sin of slavery, but in the virtue of freedom. And he said, we have always been friends of the white men. We were a free people long before white men came to our land. Our tribe was always free. They lived in Roanoke in Virginia. When the English came to Roanoke, our tribe treated them kindly. One of our tribe went to England in an English ship and saw that great country. In his story of his people's origins, Lowry's emphasized his ancestors' freedom, their hospitality and reciprocity with English newcomers, and the journey from their original homeland to this place in Robinson County. Their original homeland was Roanoke, where these virtues were nourished. In that moment, Lowry sought to <coughs> strike a blow against death by pointing out the betrayal of at least one of these virtues, friendship with whites. Acts of remembrance like George Lowry's are partly a faithful recounting of a speaker's knowledge of the past and partly an attempt to reorder the present chaos. All origin stories explain the present while recounting the past. Outsiders have interrogated and doubted Lumbee's stories, however, and this has allowed those same outsiders to substitute versions of Lumbee origins that made sense of their own worlds, not of the Lumbees. The person who recorded George Lowry's story, for example, Hamilton McMillan, used it to conclude that the Lumbees descended from the lost survivors of the first English settlement on Roanoke Island and the, quote, friendly Indians who took them in. Others who wrote at the very same time said that the Lowry family's ancestors were Tuscarora Indians, enemies of the English defeated in the war that made truly permanent English settlement possible in North Carolina. Some Tuscarora villages, of course, were located near the Roanoke River, not Roanoke Island, but neither writer bothered to find out which one George Lowry meant. Outside observers have shifted the values we find in Lumbee origin stories to fit their own values. So rather than qualities <coughs> like freedom and hospitality that George Lowry talked about, outsiders cast Lumbees in terms of inferiority, both biological and cultural. Those outsiders described Indians' relationships to whites as either subservient or hostile. These substitutions are not merely misinformed or ignorant. They actually deny America's original people, us, the values of liberty and generosity while allowing newcomers to seize those qualities for themselves. Some mistaken versions of Lumbee origins further reduce the complexity of American history. Those versions collapse a diversity of identities into just two, white and black, with Indians forgotten entirely. Oversimplifying history in this way makes injustices inevitable. George Lowry's view may not be the only version of Lumbee origins, but it nevertheless gives us a legitimate starting place from which to piece to the documentary record together. That process begins with an understanding that the Lumbee's homeland is larger than Robinson County. Many of the Lumbee's ancestors came from places as far north as the James River in Virginia and south to the Great PD River in South Carolina, east to the Atlantic Ocean and west to the Great PD and Catawba River. So if you look at the map that Nancy handed out a minute ago, that's sort of the shorthand of the, you know, the few of the tribes that um, occupy that ancient or longer standing homeland. Outsiders trying to analyze these origins, these tribal origins, tend to lose themselves in the wrong questions. The search for a single historic tribe from which the Lumbees descend will not lead to a definitive account of the tribe's early history. Furthermore, it ignores the complexity of Indian pasts and Indian cultures. The Lumbees' ancestors had family names, like Lowry, and place names, like Roanoke. These names are not descended unchanged from time immemorial. Instead, they've been adaptable. They do change. Would they have complex histories? They carry different meanings over time, just like native people are complex people. So one tribal name or a single cultural origin is insufficient to explain Lumbee history because Lumbee ancestors belong to the many dozens of nations, some of which are on that map, that lived in this 44,000 square mile territory. It's hard to get your mind around. 
So this ethnic diversity of this area is hard to comprehend when American history teaches you that Indians are a race of people. So today we understand the word race to mean members of a group that share certain physical characteristics and a common culture, allowing for possible differences in customs and attitudes such as like northerners are different than southerners. Um, but before the settlers came, Indians in North and South Carolina and in Virginia were enormously different from each other, physically and otherwise. Even so, they had much in common. All of them valued family, and many placed heavy emphasis on the power of women to determine belonging and political decisions. These Indians traced a family's descent from the mother's line or from the lines of both parents equally rather than only from the father's line. So the enormous destruction that was wrought by disease during these first two centuries of European exploration and settlement diminished this cultural diversity among Indians. Influenza, smallpox, measles, and typhus all came from Europe. Malaria and yellow fever came from Africa. And in light of these facts, the question of where Lumbees come from is less important than why we're still here. In fact, we don't have a comprehensive account of any Indian groups in Piedmont or Eastern North Carolina before the early 1700s, not that long ago in sort of, you know, tribal time when John Lawson, who was North Carolina's Surveyor General, traveled through in his effort to measure and divide the land. At this time, Native peoples in the Carolinas were likely in the midst of the greatest smallpox epidemic they had experienced. Even then, Lawson remarked on Indians' remarkable cultural diversity. We don't have a written record of a Lumbee voicing the tribe's history until Hamilton McMillan recorded George Lowry's testimony in 1865. Hamilton McMillan, of course, believed that Indians from Croatoan Island, survivors of a massacre committed by the English in 1587, adopted these desperate lost settlers and that their descendants settled on Drowning Creek, of course, later called the Lumber River. McMillan pointed to the English surnames in the list of colonists, Lowry was not among them, and found parallel names among Robeson County Indians. While some of the surnames, such as Samson, Brooks, and Barry, are unquestionable matches, most of the similar names are found as much in the English population as in the Lumbee population. Further, we have no evidence that American Indians regarded English surnames as more special than any other kind of name. It's difficult to imagine that a group of Indians who took in foreign refugees would have changed their own naming practices to accommodate these newcomers and then maintain them for over 200 years. But hundreds of articles, books, plays, poems, a national park, and a tourist economy have been devoted to the story of these few dozen lost English colonists. Stephen B. Weeks, a very respected North Carolina historian, called their fate, quote, the tragedy of American colonization. Weeks wrote that if Macmillan's theory of Lumbee origins is rejected, he said, then the critic must explain in some other way the origin of a people which, after the lapse of 300 years, show the characteristics, speak the language, and possess the family names of the second English colony planted in the Western world. But there are many more plausible reasons for Lumbee's similarity to Europeans besides their possible connection to the lost colony. First among them is that Indian people, like any other, change. They borrow, they transform what they find useful, including languages, foods, stories, materials, religions. Far less is written in tribute to this process or to the Indians who continue to maintain power in Eastern North Carolina for more than a century after the colony was lost. Of course, Indian people remembered, but their stories went largely unrecorded until Hamilton McMillan wrote down George Lowry's eulogy for his murdered sons. George Lowry spoke of these events that prompted change with the very specific intention of shaming the newcomers whom his ancestors had befriended but who had betrayed Indian people. That winter day, Lowry continued his origin story on the steps of the Robinson County Courthouse. He said, when English people landed in Roanoke, we were friendly, for our tribe was always friendly to white men. We took the English to live with us. 
There is the white man's blood in these veins, as well as that of the Indian. In order to be great like the English, we took the white man's language and religion, for our people were told they would prosper if they would take white men's laws. Lowry, in his grief, glossed over the decisions that Indian people made that had led to these English-Indian alliances. They didn't all happen in the context of the lost colony. They unfolded over hundreds of years following that particular event. He emphasized how the Lumbee's ancestors changed, borrowing English worldviews through language and religion that suited Indians' determination to survive. But culture change was also a two-way process. Both sides had to adapt. Lowry knew that he could not do justice to the whole story, not on that day when he wanted to expose the injustice of his people's circumstances. But historians and genealogists today can bring a lot more context to George Lowry's statements. European settlers on the northern part of Carolina, if you look at the map again, kind of look at you know, the border of Virginia, that kind of that area, they encountered an indigenous world where family was everything. George Lowry shared this value system with his ancestors. Before Europeans arrived, Indian families organized themselves into clans. Belonging, rights, and responsibilities were dictated by clan membership. Law and order, trade and prosperity, war and diplomacy, healing and caregiving, moral values, religious duties, all of these flowed through clans and other Indian institutions. Clans created bands, towns, <coughs> villages, and larger societies that varied greatly in structure across the Lumbee's original homeland. Settlers found that some of the Lumbee's ancestors traced belonging and clan leadership through maternal, not paternal, lineage. Children belonged to the community because their mothers belonged to a specific clan. The eldest women of the clan were clan mothers and thus responsible for making economic, social, political, and military decisions. Some Lumbee ancestors, such as those coastal Indians that met the first English colony, probably recognized a father's family as kin and not a mother's, while other groups managed a mixture of both systems, father and mother, um, tracing kin from both sides of the family. Regardless, Indian identity centered on family ties, not tribal names. Tying group membership to family meant that the privileges and obligations of gender and kinship governed the community. Women controlled the production and distribution of corn, the staple food, and worked as the primary farmers. Men hunted and served as diplomats, bringing in game, trade goods, and outsiders. As waves of disease, warfare, enslavement, and settlement reduced Indians' numbers, some groups quickly allied themselves with colonial governments, while others maintained stiff opposition to colonial intrusion. Amid chaos and death, the survivors kept the most elemental cultural practices alive. They continued to extend hospitality to their kin, to wage war on people who proved to be enemies, and to make strangers into kin. But the distinctions between Indian and European societies blurred. For the Lumbee's ancestors, governing cultural exchanges became less, and less critical than surviving them. Starting in the 1660s, European refugees from Virginia ne negotiated land exchanges with a different native group than the Algonquian villagers who might have adopted Sir Walter Raleigh's colony. The English knew, that, knew these people as the Tuscarora Nation, the real people as they called themselves, and they lived inland from the coast. They too were connected to a place called Roanoke, but it was the Roanoke River, not Roanoke Island. For anyone who hoped to escape the authority of a king or a lord, Tuscarora territory was a safe place so long as one followed Tuscarora rules. Many of the North Carolina colony's white inhabitants were debtors trying to elude authorities in Virginia or in South Carolina, or they were indentured servants who had escaped or completed their indenture and been granted a <coughs> land. Pirates who marauded between the West Indies and North Carolina's coast also took a liking to the place. Enslaved Africans and Indians escaping from the port towns of Wilmington or New Bern, and even from the Cooper River or Low Country plantations of South Carolina 
probably took refuge along Drowning Creek also. People of various origins, whether born free or having freed themselves, converged in North Carolina. Yet one man's sanctuary is another man's sewer. A Virginia governor described this territory as nothing but the sink of America or the refuge of our renegades. People of both African and European descent escaped Virginia society into northeastern North Carolina, and the descendants of Africans dropped off on the coast by Francis Drake in the 1580s may have also continued to live in the area. So this society that blossomed under Tuscarora's supervision had been multiracial, or at least it seemed that other people's conceptions of race did not matter very much. Unlike Virginia, which began prosecuting interracial marriages in the 1630s, North Carolina didn't outlaw these unions until 1715. It seems likely that in that time, the indigenous ancestors of the Lumbees had children with English and African people. We know little about the relationships that Lumbee ancestors established with outsiders, except that those outsiders most likely followed the kinship laws of, of Indians when establishing f families with them. We do know that many record keepers labeled Lumbee ancestors mulatto or Negro or white or Indian and ignored the community identities that Indians themselves considered more important. The Tuscarora War between 1711 and 1713 was a violent explosion of tensions over who would control trade and who would control land. It was one of the wars that George Lowry probably alluded to in the concluding statement of his 1865 history lesson. He said, in the wars between white men and Indians, we always fought on the side of white men. Some Tuscarora villages did ally with the English in this war and some stayed neutral, but Lowry's ancestors could have been Tuscaroras who fought against the English. He probably had some on both sides of the war. In the winter of 1713, South Carolina and its Indian allies, a force of 900 men, attacked the largest Tuscarora fort, Fort Neoroga. After a 22-day siege, the enemies broke Tuscarora defenses and conducted a genocidal killing or capture of 950 Indian men, women, and children. When the English set fire to a portion of the fort, almost 400 people burned alive. A European observer called Fort, called Fort Niroga a spectacle of, as he said, wounded savages strategically massacred. The winning army sold many of the survivors into slavery in the Caribbean and other survivors, whether direct victims of the war or in allied communities who suffered because of it, may have used the well-traveled paths and rivers to move to Drowning Creek. When George Lowry spoke of a place called Roanoke, he and his people's close ties to the and his people's close ties to the English, he implied much about his own family. Roanoke might have indeed referred to to a place where his great grandmother's Tuscarora ancestors resided. Her name was Celia or Sally Percy. She was born and raised near a place called Indian Woods, located on the banks of the Roanoke River on the eastern edge of North Carolina. Her mother may have been among the few Indians not killed during the Tuscarora War or enslaved after it. After the war ended in 1713, North Carolina officials relocated Celia's mother and her family, along with other combatants, to Indian Woods, while other survivors from some of the Tuscarora towns later relocated to upstate New York to join the Iroquois Confederacy. Celia's mother was Tuscarora, but her father, Thomas, probably may have belonged to the Wayana community of Virginia. So though their nations had been torn apart politically, the Tuscaroras, Wayanas, and others maintained customs of kinship and, knowledge of this, and a knowledge of the settlers that supplied an obvious strategy for their survival. To preserve themselves, Indians would get as far away from English so-called civilization as possible, and they would ensure that their children nurtured community loyalties. In the 1750s, Celia married a man named James Lowry. She, James, and her family moved south to what was then called Drowning Creek. With his talent for business and apparent connections to whites, James Lowry might have chosen to settle in a more well-traveled, populous place 
but he and his wife's family probably chose the relative backwater of Drowning Creek because it was outside the clear control of either North or South Carolina. The Lumbee's ancestors gathered together in this way after experiences of war, betrayal, and dislocation, intending to secure their families and secure their attachments to land that they hoped was so far outside colonial jurisdiction that newcomers could not take it from them. Colonial governments had tried to destroy these families who belonged to the tribes in the region. But here, in the swamps of Drowning Creek, the survivors of war could live outside English control and still nurture their community. This territory, of course, was forest and swamp, except for the footpaths that they used to navigate through dry places. The Lowry Road, also called the Mulatto Road, was one of the first of these paths to appear on English maps. It runs, as you know, from the Cape Fear River in Cumberland County into South Carolina, carved out by local Indians and natives from other places well before Europeans became aware of it. While the road became a place for travel, the resident Indians also protected it as a boundary for their family settlements, which kept it hidden from view. <clears throat> Indians like George Lowry tell their history knowing that the truth of stories shift, even as the facts remain constant. In turn, some facts are better remembered than others. Some are still useful, some are no longer useful. Any community, every kind of nation, tells part and leaves other parts untold. And no one can tell it all. The needs and uses of history are ever-changing like water we've seen with our hurricane. Water does not respect pol politics. It does not respect politeness. It goes where it must. And I think about the flooding at Harper's Ferry, and that's where James Lowry <coughs> set up his tavern and set up his ferry, and the fact that Florence showed us that water goes where it must. Indians may have forgotten or chosen not to say their, in their Indian ancestors' tribal names. Those names would have been in languages that they no longer used. Indeed, for the multilingual community developing around Drowning Creek, in English was the only common language. George Lowry and other Lumbee storytellers have chosen the parts they want to remember about places, families, and the lessons learned from encounters with Europeans. Lowry's ancestors and those who lived with them gave new names to their places, places Lumbees regard today as their oldest settlements. The Lowry Road, Prospect, Hopewell, Saddle Tree, Union Chapel, Burnt Swamp, Fair Grove, Wakala, and many more. When Lumbees speak to each other about who they are, they use these place names and family names. They may be uttered in English rather than an indigenous language, but they are Indian names nonetheless. So just as Lumbee and American history is a group of stories that are told, it's also a collection of silences that conceal truths. The name Mulatto Road is but one example of such concealment. Outsiders use Mulatto to describe the Lumbees and their ancestors, and it's a label that speaks to racial ancestry, Indian, black, and white. But the label is not necessarily how Lumbees describe themselves, because it does not represent kinship. Lowry, as a name, represents people and relationships, not race, and so that is the name they have upheld, just as they have upheld family. George Lowry did not tell us about all the Lumbee's places and families in his story. Genealogy, of course, maps, archaeology, all tell us about the variety of relationships Indians had with the English. Archaeologists, for instance, have found evidence of Indians continuously living around Drowning Creek from at least 1000 AD through the 18th century when Europeans began traveling in the area. In 1725, a man named John Herbert drew a map of the entire region, including several Indian villages. Some of them he named, such as the ones belonging to the Waccamaw, the Shara, and the Pedi Indians, but one he marked that he did not name. That, name. that village is located most closely to Drowning Creek, and it may be where some Lumbee ancestors lived before the Lowrys and other families arrived here. Perhaps John Herbert did not name the village because he could not find a single name that fit 
didn't mean that they didn't know who they were, but that they had a variety of ancestors and that there was no one single name that worked. Europeans have concealed aspects of Lumbee history by not naming places, but when Indians themselves adapted English surnames, the exchanges between Europeans and natives became more obvious. A few miles west of that unnamed village, a Shiraw headman named Robert sold the deed to an old field, most likely a cornfield abandoned by his ancestors, to an early European settler, a man named Thomas Grooms. There were perhaps as many 40 of these fields around Drowning Creek, indicating that Shiraz or other Indians had occupied this area for generations by the 17, early 1700s. Another early settler, Henry O'Berry, held two pieces of land near the Lowry Road in 1748. Like James Lowry, these men may have married Indian women, and their sons and daughters certainly married Indians. 100 years after Henry O'Berry received his land grant, another Henry Berry was born, the great-grandson of James Lowry and the nephew of George Lowry. Shiraw Indians were not particularly welcome in English settlements in the Carolinas. They were known more for raiding colonists than for trading or adapting to settlers' influence like the Tuscarora had. Bands of Shiraz stayed on the move between Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. One group lived about 40 miles west of Drowning Creek in the early 1700s, and another lived among the Catawba tribe around the same time. Guests at the area known as Hunt's Bluff, overlooking the Great Petey River near the Petey Indian Village, was home to some of the Lumbee's ancestors who came, carried the name Hunt. Other evidence indicates that the first Hunt was a European who married into one of the Indian families, possibly Shiraw, who lived in the Drowning Creek area. Families named Driggers, Bones, Jacobs, Quick, Sweat, Cooper, all founding Lumbee families, had been living in this same area when the English moved in. Still other Shiraz resided in what appeared to be multi-tribal and multi-racial settlements along the Virginia border in Granville County, about 150 miles north of here. Some Shiraz lived alongside Saponi Indians and others in Granville County on the land of Colonel William Eaton, a British trader with the Catawba. When Eaton died in 1761, those Indian families began looking for a place to go. One option was to live with the Catawba, with whom the South Carolina government had confined to a reservation, and another option was to relocate to other areas that appeared free of government control. Families that chose the latter are among the Lumbee's ancestors. The Chavises, for example, journeyed south from Eaton's land to join the Lowry's and others, but no one recorded their tribal names. Instead, colonial officials labeled one Lumbee ancestor, William Chavis, a Negro, but his father was probably an English immigrant to Virginia, and his mother was a free woman. She, it's most likely that she had African, Indian, or European ancestry, perhaps all three. Some records suggest she was a Wianic Indian, like Celia Kersey's father. We should not assume that because one observer labeled William a Negro, that he was not, in fact, an Indian. Another Lumbee forefather, Charles Oxendine, was labeled mixed blood and mulatto before the American Revolution, but then white and free person of color after the Revolution. This variation among Lumbees reflects more confusion among colonial record keepers than among Indians who retained their own family histories. In the 1750s, another group of men, all named Locklear, relocated to Drowning Creek and they acquired large tracts of land. Two of them, the brothers Major and John Locklear, moved to Long Swamp in a community that their descendants, of course, named Prospect. Prospect. <laughs> Y'all know this history better than I did. They were born in northeastern North Carolina, Major and John, near the Roanoke River in Halifax County. They came to Robison and established large families, probably with Indian women who may have been affiliated with the Shiraz or another group that had made their homes here. While other Indian communities in the region had a history of signing treaties with European powers in exchange for land, Lumbee founding families did not negotiate these agreements. Settlers frequently did not see them as Indians after the Tuscarora War, reduced their military threat, and scattered the refugees. 
Further, the land to which they scattered did not seem all that desirable, except to other refugee or outlaws like themselves, or to the people who sought independence and in living outside the clear jurisdiction of a colonial government. Those settlers, people like Henry O'Berry or Thomas Grooms, learned to negotiate and become useful to Indians. Some of their descendants came to identify as Indians, but not all of them. The history of this place is also the Lumbee's history. Thus, we tell it differently than the English do. We were not friendly Indians, as in the stories told about Squanto in Massachusetts or Pocahontas in Virginia, stories that are themselves deeply misunderstood. In the 1580s and in the 17-teens, Lumbee ancestors had reasons to be unfriendly. They wanted nothing to do with strangers, only with kin, and they went to Drowning Creek to regain their strength. It was, after all, the perfect hiding place, largely inaccessible unless one knew the rivers and the swamps. While the Lowry Road skirted these swamps, allowing travelers a way through, Lumbee ancestors embraced territory that was similar to their former homes along, along the Roanoke River, the Great Petey River, and others. Meanwhile, the swamps themselves were miles of thick brush, black water, enormous trees thriving in the water, mushy peat, quicksand, cottonmouths, brown snakes. British settlers didn't crave it, but the Lumbees invested in it and made it their own. The environment carried many threats, but it must have felt secure nonetheless. By the 1750s, the people of Drowning Creek and its swamps knit together families in places. They traced belonging through kinship, spoke English, and farmed. Those were the shared ways that they could make sense of their world. After almost 200 years of contact with colonizers who were bent on saving them, destroying them, or creating common cause with them, the survivors took the lessons of those previous centuries and regenerated their, ide their identity as an Indian community. They developed a nation that, while it did not look like the emerging American nation, operated independently and valued autonomy and freedom and justice. Through their practices of kinship and, the share and shared loss, they were begotten, not made. Shared history and memory of unkempt graves, of dead children, of fields and forests abandoned, set them apart from their non-Indian neighbors. But so did the determination to maintain community apart from the colonists' growing emphasis on individual rights. Families like the Lowrys, the Chavises, the Lockleers, Wilkins, Brave Boys, and others did not yet perceive all the ways that settlers would challenge their community, but they did recognize the wisdom of protecting their property within the settlers' rule of law. If they could not fully secure their rights under this new regime, they could secure their land. Over the next 200 years, however, <coughs> since the American Revolution, outsiders' interpretations of Lumbee origins have had more power than Lumbee's own histories of families and places. Just one example, and I'm going to close with this. In the 1930s, an anthropologist named John Swatton summed up the sort of tale of Lumbee journeys that I've told you in a really different way than the way I've told it. What he wrote, he was an outsider, of course, coming from Washington, D.C., trying to figure out where, who are these people? Where did they come from? He wrote that the evidence available thus seems to indicate that the Indians of Robeson County, who have been called Croatan and Cherokee, are descended mainly from certain Suwon tribes, of which the most prominent were the Shira and the Piawi. But they probably included as well imminent remnants of the Eno and Shikori, and very likely some of the coastal groups, such as the Wakama and Cape Fears. It is not improbable that a few families or small groups of Algonquian or Iroquoian connection may have cast their lot with this body of people. Quite a different way of talking about this coalescence than, I hope, than the one I've just described. But, like others before him, John Swanton glossed over the motivations for Indian people to move and to come together. But he did so not with a moral intent, as George Lowry had possessed. Instead, he sought to categorize and assign an authentic-sounding tribal name to a people who needed only family and places to understand who they were. Who's your people? Where do you stay at? 
The United States needed John Swanton's way of telling a native origin story to put the chaotic world it had created into some kind of order. Yet no origin story derived and articulated in this particular way could possibly redeem the original sins of the nation that had stolen George Lowry's family and his freedom from him. Mm. Love to hear what y'all think. <laughs> and what you would add. Take notes. Do we have time? Do we, we have time, time for questions? Question? Okay. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I'm not lonely. <laughs> you look like you might be. <laughs> I knew your father. Yeah. I think you already know that. Mm -hmm. Time is short. Um, <clears throat> I noticed that you chose George rather than Alan. Why did you do that? Well, George. George's words were writ written down. You know, we don't have many. By yeah, by Macmillan. We don't have many words of Alan written anywhere. We have got, of course, Strike at the Wind recreates Alan as a character, leaves out George entirely, which I think is kind of curious. But, um, but you know, the only words that I'm aware of that have been written down from Alan were written in the midst. Well, after his death, in the midst of the Lowry conflict. Calvin wrote them. Calvin wrote them. Yeah. His, his son yeah, wrote them. Wrote yeah. So I think, and I also wanted to, the particular words written up, <coughs> down that George said sort of helped me understand what we should, what we should know about our origins. You know, when you think about this pervasive question of where do the, where do the Lumbies come from, George Lowry actually told us, or at least Helms and McMillan recorded a version of it, and I just thought that helped answer a question. He was the son of James Lowry. Mm -hmm. Grandson, I think, of James Lowry. No? Grandson. Grandson. Doesn't his father William? Yeah. Yeah. George and oh, Alan's you're right. father. I'm wrong. George and Alan's father was William. Yeah. William was a, the Patriot soldier. Um, that correct. was wounded in the like Battle that. of Morris Creek Bridge, I think. Um Walt's and I are the same age. <laughs> <laughs> I wish he would he would well oh, he's here with us. <laughs> he was, I wish he's still here, but he's here. He was pretty good at math. He was. Yeah. He taught at uh, math and statistics here at UNCP. Any other questions? Really? <laughs> I have another question. I don't have a normal. Well, Buck, Buck has one. Let's Buck just, has one. We'll come back. Yeah. You mentioned a few times, thank you. You mentioned a few times the uh, Wayanok or Wayanok, Hainok or Eno, some of the mm -hmm. names for, for people. One with uh, uh, the ancestry of uh, Kersey, and then again a little bit, I think, late, later on in the presentation. So there was someone else that had. Can you speak more to about the evidence for those um, identifications? I think I know more about the you, top uh, war, you know, uh, identifications and, and, and Shira. I'm interested because uh, the, uh, the way I know moved so many places mm -hmm. um, after, say, the mid 17th century, and their um, the peoples in the documentary record can be found mm -hmm. at Nottaway, mm -hmm. at Tuscarora, at the United Halifax County, mm -hmm. and there's some very interesting specific names associated with them. So I wonder maybe if, if there's um, evidence that you could speak to or, or reveal. Well, so probably the same evidence that, that you already know about, but my, I'm drawing those conclusions based on research done by you as well as Cedric Woods, in particular in trying to piece together the evidence evidence of um, Algonquian names like Pohagan that are present in the Wayana community and some of these other Nottaway and related kind of Virginia, North Carolina borderland communities. So there are several surnames that were, I don't know how prominent they were, but they exist in the record. <laughs> exist in this very thin documentary record around the late 1600s and early 1700s that seem to have clear relationship to the Algonquian Indian language, and Pohagan is one of these names. And so um, a woman named Mary Pohagan has ties to the Thomas Kersey family. 
that Cedric Woods have, has investigated more deeply. And so, so it could be Cho Wan. It, it could be, be Cho Wan. Yeah, it could, yeah it I mean, I'm, I'm definitely guessing. <laughs> and I think Cedric's conclusions about Wayanic were partly based on the same sort of set of guessing that you do when you think about maps that English people create. So I talked about the John Herbert map that just describes this area. There's many other rich kind of map resources in Virginia where Europeans are labeling places uh, with tribal names. And so whether they got that right, we don't know. You know, what we do, what we can do is try to kind of notice patterns or notice inaccuracies or inconsistencies and how your, what Europeans wrote down about these ancestors. Um, and so when I picked Wayanic, I picked it because it was one of a couple of likely ones, but I think I think Nottaway is very likely. I also didn't talk, and I'm sure there are sweats here, I didn't talk today about the sweat families from Virginia, but they are seem pretty firmly tied to monkey communities. That was gonna be my next That's your next okay. <laughs> But you know, so there's so the process of doing this genealogical work, as you all know, is just really about piecing together information that sometimes contradicts itself. And I think my general rule is be suspicious of the way Europeans have, have talked about and talked about these peoples and look you know, look for patterns and then notice where inconsistencies also are. The, the Wayanic also, I think, was compelling to me because there are, there's another reference to Wayanic Indians fighting alongside the British in the French and Indian War in the 1750s. And Thomas Hersey, Celia, Celia's father, is um, recorded as fighting alongside the British in the Seven Years' War. And so knowing also that there were some Wayanics or people who were called Wayanics by the English, that fought with the British in the Seven Years' War, and then associating that with Thomas Percy, also fighting with the British, made me sort of wonder if perhaps Wayanic was one of, you know, a correct identity. So, yes, sir. Well, you mentioned briefly a uh, uh, site that's a thousand years old in, in your, your talk. Can you expand a little more on the pre-Columbian? Uh, is there archeological sites within the county or close that uh, would be pre-Columbian? Yeah, there are, and um, the, the reading that I've done on that work is largely generated by this museum and by its former director, Stanley Nick, who's an archeologist, and I'm, in, the, in your collections you have many of his writings and other kinds of data that he's he had put together over the years. Um, he published a very helpful summary of that work in a journal called Native South several years ago. Um, and what he talks about in terms of his, his archaeological investigations are mound sites that are in this community. When I say this community, I kind of mean this region of the state, uh, as well as places like Hunts Bluff in South Carolina that are not too far from here that have long archaeological evidence of, of continuous occupation for a very long period of time. So um, I know from my like casual discussions with Lumbees who have family in South Carolina that most likely, again, if we're going to assign some tribal names to some folks, <laughs> the PD communities in South Carolina have been occupying that territory for many, many thousands of years. And so we have some mound sites that are mostly destroyed now because of farming or perhaps floods or other kinds of um, natural disasters. Uh, we also, but well, we also have places like Hunts Bluff, where if if more research was done, we may find cemeteries that are not marked, or we may find other kinds of even more recent archaeological evidence. So some folks have talked in, in the UNC world about doing some historic archaeology on some of what we know are the Lowry's land going back to the 18th century, and learning what we can kind of find from the way that they were living. Um, that can tell us a little bit more about about ancestors even further back. So, so you know, it's it's clearly what we can say is that there have been Indians in this place for thousands of years. Whether all of our people descend from all of those Indians seems unlikely to me. Uh, looking at genealogy, 
but but yeah, there's you know there's a good reason to think of this as an Indian <coughs> homeland because there have been indigenous people here, yeah, forever. Okay. <coughs> you uh, did a uh, I read four chapters of the book. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the Can you afternoon. teach me how to? Read yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't have a pen. Okay. <laughs> Um, you and you did an interesting thing with the genealogy, the first, right in the very beginning of the book. Are you want to tell us about that? Because I'm interested. Well, I thought to read it. I've ever seen that. This, okay. So, so this was an experiment, and if I get really emotional as I read it, I apologize because I have been, you know, working on this for a really long time. Again, not with the depth of knowledge that many of you have about family histories, but trying to piece together kind of what I could. And so it was suggested to me, I thought maybe, you know, so some people have read this over time, they're like, well, all the family names are so confusing. You know, if you're not Lumbee or you're not Tuscarora, you're not from here, the family names just get really, you know, puzzling. And I was like, well, do I need a chart? Like, do I need a family tree? And I was like, no, family trees are not so exciting. <laughs> and I started thinking about the book of Matthew, you know, and how the book of Matthew opens up with Jesus' genealogy. And I was like, what if I were to write a genealogy that was kind of like the book of Matthew? <laughs> and so here's what I came up with, um, if you guys will just bear with me for a minute. Um, and I, and I decided to do it in such a way as to, to kind of mention many of the folks in the book, but not all of them, so people could sort of reference a little bit how these people are related. Um, and then, of course, it comes down to me because I have stories in the book and my family's stories are in the book. Um, and finally, to my daughter. So in the beginning, there was the water and the pine. From the sky, a woman fell or the creator made four daughters. In any case, the people came into being and the people have remained. Then there were the names, and the names remained with the people also. There was a man sent from Virginia, and his name was James Lowry. James married Sally after the war at the time of the journey. Sally was the mother of William, the patriot, soldier, and Jimmy, the jockey. <coughs> William, the father of Alan, the one marked for death. Alan, the husband of Catherine and then Mary. There was a man sent from Virginia and his name was John Oxendine, the orphan. John married Sarah, the mother of Charles, the landowner. Charles, the husband of Anne. Anne, the mother of Nancy, the runaway, and Louis, the bootlegger, Betsy and James. Betsy, the mother of John. James, the father of Big Jim, the politician. There was a man sent from the South, and his name was John Brooks. John married Patty, daughter of William, the Patriot. John married another woman, whose name we do not recall. She, the mother of Lovedee, who is the mother of legions. <laughs> legions. <laughs> Patty, the mother of Mitty, who is the mother of Sandy. There was a man sent from the Granville district, and his name was Robert Locklear. Robert married a woman whose name we do not recall. She was the mother of Randall, who married Sarah. She was the mother of Major and John, who married women whose names we do not recall, after the war at the time of the journey. Randall was the father of Big Arch. Mother was, Major was the father of Lazy Will. John was the father of Samuel. Samuel, the grandfather of Preston, the schoolmaster, and Margaret. Margaret, the wife of Nathan, the former slave. Preston, the father of Governor, the doctor. There was a man sent from a place we do not recall, and his name was Canon Cumbo. Canon married Allie, the mother of Stephen. Stephen married Sarah, the mother of Mary and Christian. Mary, the second wife of Alan, the one marked for death. Christian, the wife of Betsy's son, John. Lazy Will, the father of Catherine, wife to Alan, the one marked. Catherine was the mother of Patrick, the preacher. Mary, second of Alan's wives, was the mother of Henry Berry, the outlaw. Mary, also the mother of Calvin, the preacher. Christiane, the wife of John, was the mother of Henderson, the singer. Sandy, the son of Mitty, was the father of Joseph, the advocate, and Melinda, the turpentiner. 
the grandfather of Dalton, the peacemaker. Melinda was the mother of Bloss. Um, Calvin, the son of Allen, was the father of Dr. Fuller, the politician. <laughs> Love Dee, the mother of Legions, was grandmother of Beat Ann, the first recognized. Um, also great grandmother of Pikey and Lawson, the Longhouse leaders. Patrick the Preacher was the father of Martha the Bootlegger and Emmeline. The bootleggers are all in there. Emmeline, the wife of Preston, the schoolmaster. Martha, the mother of Lucy, the gardener. Lucy, the mother of Waltz, like the dance. Henderson, the singer, married Virginia. Virginia, the mother of James, the fiddle player. James, the father of Foy, the farmer. Foy, the husband of Bloss, daughter of Melinda, the turpentiner. Bloss, the mother of Louise, the teacher. Waltz, the husband of Louise. I miss my dad. Um, Louise, the mother of Melinda, who married Willie, the songwriter. And then Grayson, the storyteller. Melinda, the mother of Lydia, the loved. She were here. She goes, it's okay, mommy. <laughs> And then I ended with this, I think, classic line from, I believe it's the book of Matthew. Behold how the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Because that's just a few people. <laughs> <laughs> you realize yeah. that you knitted together what the one piece are about. I tried to. Yeah, hard. It's not really all, all there. You know, as a historian, I just got to geek out as much as possible. It's pure poetry, though. Yeah. Thank you. And it's beautiful. Thank you. It's, you know, it's, I, I, I wish I could actually literally put everybody in there, but of course. This Yeah, the chancellor we're still here, we'll put that on his list of things to find. <laughs> um, because, you know, I've, I've sort of tried that in lots of different ways, imperfect ways over time, especially with land deeds. So you can learn a lot when you take these 18th century and early 19th century land deeds that Lumbee families um, recorded in the courthouse and plot them on maps. And then basically being able to accurately locate them would be a real, a, you know, something very important for community members to participate in, as well as kind of add genealogies. I would love to set that up. Yeah. And people just join in. And contribute to it. I mean, it would be a project. Um, and some of the tools exist to do it, but there might be some, some new tools that we would want to create. Do we have one more question? The love deep crush freeze. I just wanted to know, is there any genealogy or ancestors on Hamilton with Willis? His family? Because we are McMillan's on our father's side. Yeah. I named my son Hamilton McMillan, and he's 42 now. He's uh -huh. 42. So I, I don't, you, you yeah. probably know more than I do. I mean, the McMillan's that I know of are the folks who married into Preston Locklear's family, McMillan Road area. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's many, but the McMillan's are also kind of like the Mainers, and that there's several sets, mm -hmm. as I understand it. And mm -hmm. I do remember my father telling us that uh, one of his grandfathers came from Ireland. From, yeah. On a ship to Georgia and uh -huh. went to Hope County and married. Uh huh. Well, and that's, that. yeah, that makes a lot of sense too. I didn't really talk about the, the Irish or the Scottish 
Connection. Relationships that we've yeah, developed. His, his mother's a, she's a Scott also. Yeah. I just wondered whether our line was being related to Hamilton's mother's line. I just don't, I don't know, but we should look into that because he, he's he got family too. <laughs> so we should know. That would be interesting. People have often asked, other, other historians have said, why would Hamilton McMillan take any interest in these non white? people, you know, because people have their ideas, and I'm kind of like, well, he needed them as voters on the one hand, but also it, there could have very well been a <coughs> kind of I know one that in this case was about was uh, a doctor in Red Springs, mm -hmm. Lisa McMillan, mm -hmm. and Ed said we were related to him, but him being white, and our relatives being lumpy, they just didn't like to say have that communication. They, yeah, there was, especially during the Jim Crow period, right, a lot of these ideas about Lumbee's racial ancestry being of mixed race and the, the particular kind of um, negative way that that's looked upon is actually very, very recent. I mean, I don't think anybody before the 1880s really looked at that type of racial mixture here and said it was a bad thing or said that that made you not Indian, you know. But in the 1930s, these theories and so forth got start circulated that if the Lumbees had ancestors who were not Indian, who were white or black, then that made us not, made us not Indian. But that's a very recent, you know, way of looking at the world that comes directly from segregation, I think, and the philosophy of segregation. Because he knew that his, grand his grandfather on his father's side was white. So mm -hmm. And his grandmother, on his mother's side, she was a white lady. Right. Interesting. So, well, thank you. Thank, and thank you all so much for with you all. So, um, I thought I would talk for a few minutes, and then maybe we can just talk about your questions about, you know, this work or Lumbee history. Um, the, the first thing I'd like to, or first people I'd like to acknowledge are, are Miss Gail Locklear. Ms. Gail, would you, her children grace the cover of this book, and Casey is right there holding her daughter. And there's Chase here to make it. He's not here yet. But um, this gift of this photograph and the the what it represents really sums up perfectly what I was hoping to accomplish in this book, which was to be able to say that the Lumbee story is America's defining story. And so if you think about what America represents, at least through the form of the flag, and here's Chase also. <laughs> okay. Thanks for your image. <laughs> um, but if you think about what the Lumbee, or what the American community represents in this picture, the flag, the fact that we have two Lumbee children represents our struggle, right? So the title, an American struggle. This is what we're struggling for. I'm so grateful to both of you and to, and to your mom for being willing to share your particular story at this, at this moment that the photograph was taken. And I've always been moved by that photograph. I've always just been so touched by it. So thank you guys. Um, I want to say a little bit in kind of an indirect way about why I kind of wrote the book. And y'all probably saw the Washington Post magazine article that came out a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. about um, Heather Nakai, where Heather was here a minute ago, but Heather Nakai's case, um, there she is, <laughs> uh, and, uh, concerning federal recognition. And the article helpfully covers a great deal of Lumbee federal recognition. Well, you know, most of you have probably had to answer the what kind of Indian are you question or where do you all come from. We had a letter to the Washington Post in response to the article that I wanted to read because it kind of sums up this typical narrative that I hear over and over again about who are the Lumbees. So this writer says, the Washington Post magazine article on the Lumbee Indians failed to mention some important historical facts. First, there is no primary source evidence that links them to a known historical tribe, not the Tuscarora, the Cherokee, or the Shira. Second, there is extensive genealogical and historical evidence that proves their descent from free blacks from Virginia who migrated to North Carolina in the 18th century. Third, they made a deal with the so-called redeemers after Reconstruction to switch from the Republican to the Democratic Party in North Car if North Carolina recognize them as an Indian tribe with their own segregated schools. Now you can see where this narrative's going, right? He's saying, like, we're not Indians. <laughs> Here's a whole book about it, but anyway. 
<laughs> There's a whole article about it. But anyway, he believes that we're not Indians. Um, the normal school they established is now the Pembroke campus of the University of North Carolina. Finally, in the 1950s, they fought the integration of their triracial Indian black and white segregated schools. There's a lot of nuance that this writer ignores and that my book tries to address. But he, he finishes by saying, these historical facts have been brought to the attention of scholars, such as myself, who ignore or dismiss them by claiming there are no facts, just context. Why teach history if we dismiss historical evidence? No wonder we live in a time when a significant part of the population doesn't know the difference between a free press, a free press and fake news. I thought, how bizarre. Why use the Lumbees as your political platform about fake news, except that he's got nothing else to go on? And there was, um, in thinking about that kind of argument that I've heard from so many of my colleagues, my historian colleagues over the years, I wrote a paragraph about it, or in response to it specifically in the book, so I wanted to kind of read that for you to help as I was thinking through why, the, why that argument is flawed, that there is no history that indicates that we are Indian people. <clears throat> and so one of the things I said in the book was, any project on American Indian history begins with recovering the words, sentences, and stories that have been erased. Mm -hmm. That invisibility shaped me from a young age as I absorbed my family's stories. Sometimes they emerged whole, but they mostly came only as tidbits of information, <coughs> puzzle pieces, not because the story is unknown, but because no one person knows the whole story. This book is one Lumbee person's attempt to assemble those pieces, a task made even more interesting amid other Southerners and Americans, routine mourning over lost histories, lost colonists, and lost causes. Growing up in North Carolina, outside of the Lumbee community, but still connected to it, I've been conscious that my ancestors were the original Southerners, here before something called the South ever existed. Yet other Americans, especially Southerners, such as this gentleman writing from Chapel Hill, interestingly, <laughs> to the Washington Post, yet other Americans, especially Southerners, freely mourn and memorialize their histories being lost or erased, all the while challenging our right as Lumbees to do the same. Instead, others look at the history we know perfectly well, if in pieces, and tell us we are not who we say we are, that we don't have a history, that we are not important. And this book is an answer to that hypocrisy. So there's a, um, just to give you a little bit of kind of an overview of what the book contains, I'm gonna read another section that's at the beginning and it's a genealogy. We've had a genealogy conference today. It's, as Nancy said, it's, um, she didn't indicate how revolutionary this conference is, but it's, it's revolutionary. <laughs> if you want to think about how important it is to tell your own story and the vibrant ways that Lumbee people do that, this is the place, and this conference is the place to do it. So part of, of course, my mission in writing this book was to specifically describe who the Lumbees are and to deal with questions like our families and kinship and the places that we come from and this very sort of as this writer from Chapel Hill does not understand the very important nuances of our history so one of the ways I tried to do that was to write a kind of genealogy and if you guys remember the book of Matthew in the Bible there's a genealogy of Jesus there at the beginning and so this is kind of written in that style except there are a little some twists to it, um, and I hope you'll you'll recognize some of the names of your ancestors. I couldn't get everybody in here, of course, but um, I tried. And I apologize if I get emotional reading it. For some reason, it always makes me emotional. <laughs> um, but in the beginning, there was water and the pine. From the sky, a woman fell, or the Creator made four daughters.